Please be seated. Uh, so folks, before I lead in a word of prayer this morning, uh, the flowers were uh, given uh, through a friend of the church, and uh, they laid to rest a loved one, I think it was uh, the Bur through the Burgoyne family. Kathy, is that correct? Allen side? Was it? Allen side, okay. Uh, also, um, we uh, laid my shirt left to rest this past Thursday, so we asked that you would lift up the Shirtliff family, and then, of course, the Pierce family. Uh, that's still fresh as well. Uh, we have a God who just loves to hear from us. He loves to shepherd us. He just wants to give us the very, very best. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, as I prayed in the prayer closet, thank you that you are a God who hears our prayers. And you bid us to come. Uh, you encourage us to come running. You encourage us to be bold. You encourage us, Lord, uh, to pour out our hearts uh, before you. Um, despite you knowing everything that there is to know, you encourage us to come that we might find strength and hope and peace in a very, very turbulent world. And in a uh, in a in a a wasteland, uh, a place that takes um, and takes and takes, uh, a place that easily destroys our soul, a place that would uh, steal not only our souls but uh, take away any semblance of salvation or hope in God. And uh, so, Father, we come boldly today. Uh, we, we come in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who has died for our sins, the one who has resurrected from the dead and who constantly lives to make intercession for each and every one of us who believe. Uh, we bless you for that. And we thank you for the faith to come into your house this day, uh, to call upon your name, uh, to sing praises to your name, and to worship you and to acknowledge you as the only God, the only Savior among men and women, whereby we might be saved. And so, Lord, we uh, bestow all praise and honor and glory to you. And we thank you that our hearts are laid bare. Uh, you know the, the burdens that are on our heart, hearts this morning, Lord. Uh, you know the things, uh, the sin, uh, and the things that easily distract us and weigh us down, and yet you uh, keep on coming to us, you, you keep on searching us out, um, you're, you're the hound of heaven, you don't, you don't give up, and I bless you for that, and your people bless you for that. Uh, we thank you that you uh, pursue us uh, with, a, with an everlasting love and, a, and an intense love, and uh, so we, we give you our hearts afresh today. And we pray that you would visit us, uh, you would touch us in a way where we know that we've been with you, and our hearts and our souls, our, our minds, our thoughts uh, would be restored, our burdens would be removed, uh, that you would make them light. Uh, also, Father, too, think of the many in our congregation who are struggling physically, um, who, uh, and when, when we... And we know that when we struggle physically, Lord, um, the, the pain and the discouragement uh, really weighs upon hearts. And so uh, we lift them up before you today, and we pray that they would sense your presence, uh, that you would give them a reprieve, uh, that you would allow them um, to see your hand of mercy and grace. And as they suffer, uh, may you remind them of their testimony uh, before others in that, in that condition. 
and uh, strengthen, uh, strengthen them to that end. Uh, also, Father, too, we want to lift up families that have lost loved ones. I think of the Pierce family. Uh, bless their hearts. Uh, thank you, uh, as, as people of faith, that we don't grieve as those who have no hope beyond the grave. Uh, so we, we pray that you would strengthen them in the days ahead. We lift up uh, Alan and Jane and uh, their family members um, that you, you would bring peace and joy. And also, Father, too, I uh, pray that those prayers would be extended to Carol Shirtliff and her family, um, especially with the, uh, the grief and the, the struggles and the dark days ahead that uh, often accompany that time. So uh, we, lift them, we lift them before you, and may they be renewed. Uh, and again, uh, that you would uh, renew their hearts and their spirits because they don't grieve as those who have no hope. Also, Father, too, I uh, want to lift up our country. Uh, pray for those that are in authority over us. Um, we ask for uh, your wisdom to prevail. We ask that your will would be done. Also, Father, too, I want to pray for the churches uh, in the community that preach the gospel. Uh, may you give unity and peace and strength, and may your word go forth from uh, each pulpit. Uh, thank you, Lord, that it doesn't return unto you void. Uh, we also know that that's true here this morning. And uh, we pray that your word would penetrate our hearts, uh, melt our hearts, Lord, uh, as we give you this time. Uh, we bless you. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have a, uh, re a scripture reading this morning. Bill. Our first reading this morning is from the New Testament. St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 3 through 13, and that begins on page 1021 of the Church Bible. For through the, through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more, of him, more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a, me a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, and in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. <coughs> He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, continuing, uh, contributing to the needs of the saints, <coughs> practicing hospitality. This is the word of our Lord. This morning, the second scripture reading, we continue in the New Testament from the book of 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verses 7 through 11. And that starts on page 1097 in the New Church Bible. 
Again, First Peter, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, on page 1097. Peter writes, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sin. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we give you this time. May you speak to each and every heart. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, folks, I want to speak to you uh, this morning about something that is very near and dear to my heart. And it's showing love to the saints, God's people. Uh, God loves his children, as you know, just like you love your children. But he loves us way more than we can ever love our own children. Uh, he knows what's best. He knows what's perfect. Amen. We kind of fumble and bumble along as parents. Uh, but God loves his children, and God's children also love his children. And this is a true mark of every Christian person, showing love to God to those whom he loves. Loving the disciples of Christ. Now, we hear an awful lot today about love, don't we? It's often couched in the language of tolerance. Uh, according to the world, we're supposed to love all things. We're supposed to love and accept all things that people do. Love has become a kind of catch-all word for nothing more than what we are to tolerate and embrace, and that is basically everything. I said this the other month, if we stand for everything, we stand for nothing. nothing. That's correct. Very, very good. Your quick studies. And as I understand the heart of God and Holy Scripture, we are to love all people, but not all things. Uh, we are not to love all things that people do. Uh, that passage of Romans says, abhor what is evil. Uh, biblical love has parameters. It's a love for God. It's a love for his word. It's a love for his people. It's a love for what he loves. It's also loving all people but not necessarily loving what they do or what they stand for. Now, the scripture says that the world loves its own. Jesus said that. And the world embraces the language of tolerance. Have you noticed? Until they come to the gospel of Christ, until they come to Christ, or until they come to Christians. You see? It's all about love and tolerance until... They can't tolerate something that they hate or someone that they hate. And I think as believers in America, we've been spoiled and deceived into thinking that everyone loves the church. Everyone loves Christ. Everyone loves Christianity. We know that that is not the truth. Christ told us that, but we, we forget it. When, you, when we come to 1 Peter here, 
This is a church that is undergoing persecution for their faith. Uh, Peter is near the end of his life. The general assumption is that he wrote these near the end of his life, possibly in Rome. And he doesn't say that the end is near because he's nearing the end of his life and he's ready to be martyred. That's not why he says the end is near. Take a look at verse 7. Peter writes that the end is near because it's near. Now, we've all heard probably in our time some preachers or some people who will say, you know, oh, the end of the world is coming. And, you know, you've, you've got to repent. Well, there, there's nothing wrong with that thought. That's a biblical thought. The end is near. This is what Peter wrote. Literally, it means in the Greek, the end is at hand, the end draws near. It's in a state of kind of like, it, 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 it keeps on moving toward that. Now, this is the same thought that James wrote in chapter 5, verse 8. He says, you too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, people look back over 2,000 years and they say, where is he? Where is the sign of his coming? Peter addresses that in 2 Peter. And here's the problem where these preachers and some of these people go wrong is that, and then you know this, they assign a date, <laughs> a day, a time. I, the Bible tells us that even the Lord Jesus, the Son of Man, at least when he was on earth, he didn't even know. And as part of the Godhead, I'm sure he knows in that sense. But, you know, we're told that he didn't even know. And yet, people fall into this pit of trying to pick a day, an hour, and a time. And, you know, the, the hubris and the arrogance that, and I had to say this, that comes from some pulpits. Amen? It's un unbelievable. I would never in my wildest dreams think about telling you folks that. Because it's not biblical. But the end, of, the end is near, that is biblical. And so in this vein, let's, let's consider our present time. Uh, it's totally a day and age of lawlessness. We've talked about that. Spiritual wickedness abounds. Uh, the other day, I said to two people, you know, it's almost like Revelation 9, you know, the bottomless pit has been letting out the demonic. I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. And you too. Some of you have been alive a lot longer than I have. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that Revelation 9 is being fulfilled as in this day and age. I'm not saying that. I said, as it, it almost seems as though, because we see a tremendous rise in the demonic. It's insane. We're living in unprecedented times of spiritual wickedness, lawlessness. And you know, you have to ask the question, how much longer will God put up with it? You know, the end is near. Drugs are being legalized. Lawlessness and violence abounds. The sexual revolution of the 60s has nothing on what's taking place today. Nothing. The promotion of LGBTQ, sex changes, abortion on demand. These, these are things, folks, that destroy people. They destroy communities, families, and in an entire society. And yet we're supposed to accept it? So, yeah, the, the end is near. And that requires sound judgment and spiritual so soberness, as Peter said in his time. Uh, you know, I was watching the news the other night. Do you know that road rage shootings now, just not like road rage incidents, but people are getting shot. People are like totally out of control. Don't have a road rage incident. It may not end well. It's crazy. People do not think. They just do. The, the thinking is irrational, and it's totally bizarre. 
They're being pet, led into paths of righteous, uh, unrighteousness, and it's being called good. Oh, it's okay if he wants to think that he's a girl. Or it's okay that she wants to think that she'd like to be a guy. I mean, who comes up with this stuff? It's insane. Sober judgment and sound thinking. And, you know, as, as the people of God, we're to be in control. We're to think right. We're to be right-minded, sober, sound judgment, assessing everything, and filtering everything through Scripture. That's how we know what's of God and what's not, amen? We have to do that. Or even we too will be led astray. So, so let, me give you, let me give you some sound judgment. The United States as a country and as a society is being uprooted before our very eyes. Can you see that? Do you see that? It's true. I'm not exactly sure how someone prepares for this. I do not know. I, 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 I sometimes want to rip my hair out. I turn off the news. It's so depressing. It, it, it's insane. I don't know how you prepare for it, but prepare for it. Because we're living in a day and age where it's just being totally uprooted. And nothing good is going to come of it. And I wish I could be a bearer of good news today and tell you all sorts of cutesy stories to tickle your ears and make you feel good as you walk out of here. That's not my job. My job is to give you the truth. And that's what's happening. And you better prepare for it. The moral and social fabric is unraveling at an unprecedented pace. The federal government that's supposed to be an authority ordained of God, they're promoting laws and stuff that has historically been known to destroy entire societies. Societies that have legalized homosexuality have always gone the way of Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you know where Sodom and Gomorrah is? It used to be at the base of the Dead Sea. That's where its location was. It is no longer. You cannot have a society that promotes that and have it survive and, and exist and last. It, it will not. And yet our government promotes it. Just the other last week, I had a dear saint send me a video of a U.S. Army soldier transvestite. They, the, the Army put out its first official video of promoting sex changes within the military. I thought, good Lord, we're totally in trouble. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. And then, of course, you know, you take a look at the states. Some of the states in our unions, in our, in our union, uh, dictatorial governors, lawlessness, refusing to respond to federal authorities, uh, defunding the police. Now, you tell me that that is sound and sober judgment. We also see this mentality and a lack of sober judgment and spirit in our churches. It's a social and cultural gospel that's being promoted anymore. It's about culturally being relevant. It's not about preaching the gospel anymore. Some churches resemble the world where they fly the rainbow flag as if that's something that's good. And then when you come to our gospel preaching churches, uh, we're too busy splitting or arguing over scripture or arguing over how to pave a parking lot. True story. I, I know of a former pastor whose church split over the paving of a parking lot. Can't make it up. You know, and, and what I see, and, and this is why I speak on it this morning, what I see is a spirit of loyalty waning. People are no longer loyal to God. 
they're no longer loyal to their country. I mean, look at, look at some of the Olympic athletes that are trash-talking our country. That's sad. That's very, very sad. Where'd that come from? They trash talk their families online. Parents berate children. Children berate their parents. And then, of course, you know, people are no longer loyal to their Christian family. They'll throw Christians under the bus like they would any, anybody else. You know, during last, this past year, we saw people in government positions and in positions of media and social influence encourage people to rat out their fellow Americans. Now, I was thinking about this, but, you know, I, I grew up during a time of the Cold War, as many of you folks did. That's, that's the stuff that took place in the Soviet Union. That's the stuff that took place behind the Iron Curtain. You tattled on your neighbor. You know, oh, they're, they're not doing this, they're doing this, they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, you know, it just breaks my heart. What, what, what happens with minding your own business? <laughs> you know, keeping your nose out of other people's stuff. You know, as long as they're not destroying my stuff or hurting my family. And yet, these are the very things that we see in our country today. The social pressure of canceling culture, canceling people. I see a society that's out of control. I see a society on the verge of turning on one another, backbiting and devouring one another. And we know that nothing good comes out of that. Uh, Paul wrote in Galatians 5, verse 15, But if you bite and devour one another, take care, lest you be consumed by one another. That's what happens. Love begets love. Anger begets anger. Wrath begets wrath. And so what I want to talk to you about today and get back to this is a love for the saints of God. Because it's a timely message today. And this may be, the Christian love may be our only social support in the days ahead. You know, we think about that. What kind, of social, what kind of social support do you have? If you've got family members that are throwing you under the bus at some point, where do you go? I remind you that the Civil War, by the way, divided not only the Union, but families. So where are you going to come for your love and your support? Uh, take a look at verse 8 here. Peter writes, before or above all things, keep fervent in your love for one another. This is, this is not teaching that we put other saints before God. But what it's saying is, first and foremost, in the things of God, love God's people. That's what it's saying. And, and that should be so near and dear to each and every saint's heart. I, I want to be loved. I know you want to be loved. That, that should be near and dear to our hearts. For, for the foremost in the things of God should be bef above, before or above all things. Foremost. Uh, you know, the, the night before Christ died, what did he tell his disciples? To love one another as I have loved you. That's what he did. Uh, it was a fervent love. It was an earnest love, and this is what Peter tells uh, the church. Uh, verse 8, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. I, I looked at the Greek here. It literally, fervent or it means intense or earnest, but it actually means to stretch out. It's the idea of continual. But I, I looked at it, and I think the spirit of it is that you go the extra mile. You go out of your way or go out of one's way to love one another. That's, that's, that's the sense here. Uh, Paul also wrote in Romans 12.10, he, he, he talked of an affectionate or tender love being shown to brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and that, 
that word over in Romans 12, verse 10, actually speaks of a family bond. In other words, it's the idea of loving the saints as you do your own children, like within the family. As a parent loves their children, we are to love other saints in the church. That's so, so precious. And, and that's, that's the kind of family bond that you would expect to find in churches, amen? That's what I want to find in a church. I want to find a loving church. And, and, and in a day and age where everything's unraveling, even within churches, in my opinion, that is the measure of any church and any believer, where, whereby a love covers a multitude of sins. That's what Peter says it looks like. Love covers a multitude of sins. My failures, your shortcomings, our sin, whether it be specific or collective, uh, is to be covered in Christian love. That's what it means. As a parent loves their children. It doesn't mean that we accept or embrace everything, but it does mean that we cover for everyone. That's what it means. Uh, it's a love that defers to Christ and others. I, in other words, where I recognize that the Lord Jesus Christ is in you, and I'm not going to criticize you, or, nor you me, or us other people in Christ. Uh, I was reading more recently of a situation where a saint and a former pastor wrote this. He said, quote, Sometimes I get discouraged with some Christians because I don't see Christ in that Christian. One time, listen to this, the Holy Spirit rebuked me. He said, quote, you are trying to see Christ in that Christian. Try seeing that Christian in Christ. That was kind of interesting. He said it made such a difference. I, he says, I was so critical. I said, he's not growing. I want to shake him. But God's seed is in him. And even though I do not see with my natural eyes, that Christian is being conformed to Christ. What a refreshing outlook. Instead of looking at people and saying, well, they're not growing, or I don't see Christ in them, you see them in Christ. God's doing a work in each and every one of our hearts. And so there should never be any room where we criticize or we throw others under the bus like that. And so to me, uh, this is the spiritual benchmark for any church, for any believer. Love covering a multitude of sins. It, it's, what, it's what the Lord Jesus did at Calvary. Amen? That's what he did. And, and I'm telling you, for what is coming, that's the kind of church you want to be in, and that's the kind of people, other saints, you want to be around. Because you're going to need a support system when everything else goes to hell in a handbasket, because it's going there real quick. And that's what God calls for, a fervent love in our churches in this way. Sacrificial. That's the way we are to treat each other like family. I'm to treat you like I would my wife, my children. Embrace, that's, take care of, that's what I'm supposed to do. Now, let me give you a great model that's put forth in Scripture here. You might want to turn over to Philemon. Uh, it's actually before uh, the book of Hebrews. But in verses 5 through 7, and it's just one chapter, but in verses 5 through 7, listen to what Paul writes about this great saint. He says, I hear of your love and of your faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may be effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. And so the picture here is of, of, of Philemon caring for and loving and refreshing the saints as he would his own family. 
Uh, you know, I, I, I've said this before, you know, we're, we're all on the spiritual journey. We have different trials. We have different pitfalls. We have different sins. We have different shortcomings, uh, maybe a, a different path that we take. But we're, we're all in it together, folks. We're all in this journey together. And, 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 and it, all of the results lead to the, the end result of glorifying Christ and lifting him up. That's, that's the end result. Uh, quickly, take a look at verse 9. Take a look at verse 9 here. Uh, our love for the saints is actually to carry over in the form of hospitality. And this is actually speaking of showing a love and a generosity to somebody who you may not know that's in Christ. So, for example, we have visitors here today. You know, much like 2,000 years ago, visitors would travel and they would come into the church. And you're to show the love and the generosity that is found in Christ, as you would to your family, to be shown to these good people here. That's the sense. Complete strangers, embracing them and showing them the love of Christ. You know, uh, through the years, uh, we've gone to, we always try to go to church uh, when we're on vacation. And uh, through the years, we've actually been invited to have a meal with people afterwards. Now, we haven't always been able to stay. But I'm talking about the affection and the tenderness and the warmth of saying, hey, why don't you come and, you know, uh, break bread and, and eat with us, have a meal, you know? <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's beautiful, it's wonderful, it really is goes a long way. Finally, uh, very, very quickly here, uh, I want you to notice, did you notice that both passages of Scripture that were read spoke of spiritual gifts? Peter closes this section, and he talks about spiritual gifts, and the Apostle Paul, in the very beginning of the section, talked about spiritual gifts. And, and this is... Um, this is huge because I think it has something, no, I'm convinced it has something to do with showing love to the saints. Every member is gifted. Every Christian is gifted. Every Christian has a spiritual role to play in the family of God for the edification and the support of the local body. And so what happens is this, is that when you exercise your spiritual gift, you bless God you bless the church, and you actually bring a blessing to yourself, right? And I see these gifts to be totally and intrinsically connected to showing a love for the saints, where you build the church up in Christ. That's what we're called to do. How else do we attain to the unity and the love and the maturity Unless we serve and we live in Christ together. I, 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 I know of no other way. And, and this leads me to say one other thing. Uh, I have a great concern today for our churches. Our church and other churches. We, we have Christians in record numbers that are forsaking the church. Now, you tell me, if you don't go to church, how do you show the love of Christ to the saint who goes to church? You can't. It's, it's an impossibility. You don't serve. You don't build up the church. You don't edify. You don't help. You don't minister. And it's, it's a huge, huge concern of mine. And, and people will come up with all sorts of excuses and reasons. And there may be some legitimate reasons, but most are not. Uh, this past year, we shut down for, what, five months? Do you know that some of our people have still not come back? Now, how do you show the love of Christ to that end? You can't. And, you know, I've said this before. You ever watch the National Geographic channel? Do you ever see the, the herds of animals that run through Africa? And then you have the lion pride. 
that stalks the herd, and it always picks off the weak, sickling, straggling one, and they're consumed. It's what happens. Uh, Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25 expresses a note of love and encouragement and a reminder not to fall into that category of forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some. Because it doesn't lead to anything that's good. Now, and the writer concludes that section by saying, as we see the day drawing near, which it is, the, that day is drawing near. So, so, so my closing word to you, r- read, the, read the verses in Philemon, but be a Philemon. Love God, have faith in God, show a great and fervent love and faith to your church family. Uh, blessings and blessings and blessings will abound when we do that. Uh, refresh the hearts of the saints. May it be an earnest love that goes an extra mile. May it be a love that covers a multitude of sins. And may it be a love bond like your own immediate family. Uh, when we have that, we'll stick closer than a brother. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, um, thank you that you have loved us all the way to the cross through your Son. Uh, We bless you and thank you for uh, his fervent love, his love covering uh, the multitude of our sins and bringing us into the family of God. And we we pray that uh, the love that we have in this church fellowship uh, would, would mimic and uh, be an example, uh, a, be a, a pattern of that love, a fervent, intense, um, covering a multitude of sins, um, a, a family bond, uh, Lord, like you've brought us into relationship with you. And uh, thank you for these scriptures. Uh, may you give us uh, the grace to carry it out. And we thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.